So uh, happy to be here in this uh, Chabad show. I forgot to say, Yuli, that I'm uh, actually a descendant of uh, Chabad, part of the Chabad family. So I really feel at home here in Toronto and in this show in particular. Chag Sameach! Chag Sameach, everybody! Chag Sameach! Yom Asmoet Sameach! We should all be very happy today because Zeh Yom Asa Hashem Nagila Ben Ismechabo We can argue if it's a Chata de Geula or not Chata de Geula or he just likes, likes to argue but one thing we cannot argue about we cannot, argue, we cannot argue about the fact that this is a miracle. This day is, in, is a day of miracles. After two thousands of ex, thousand years of exile, Jews came back to their homeland and established their own state, their own sovereignty in, in their homeland, in the Holy Land. Can there be a bigger miracle than that? So definitely this is a dramatic, uh, uh, Simcha, uh, all uh, the Arab armies were planning to finish what Hitler did not finish just three years before and were defeated by the minority of the Jews at the time and later on, later on we took away Jerusalem. Look at those miracles, it's incredible. How can we not be so happy and so thankful to Hashem on a day like this? Yet, there are a few little things to, set, to fix, you know. Hashem don't want us to be too bored, so <laughs> left us a few things to fix, and we will fix it. God willing, we'll, we'll do our share, we we'll do what we're supposed to do, and we'll all see each other next time, not here, but in Jerusalem. As you saw in the, in, in the movie, the, the, the whole concept of Manhikut Yudit is to change, to change uh, um, the way Israelis are thinking on their own identity, on their own, own Judaism, as instead of thinking of, of it as a threat, as something that's going to take away their freedom, uh, see it as their identity, as their way of life, something they're proud of, something that put, put a real goal, a real vision in front of everybody. Religious and secular, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, uh, traditional and left and right, all the Jews should be proud in their uh, identity, should understand that the real message of Judaism is freedom and not the other way around, and this way they're going to have a meaningful life on the personal level on the, on, and, and on the national, uh, national level. Uh, the eyes of the youth will start, you know, sparkle. They should be proud of their state and understand that they are part of a whole chain, a whole history that started with Avraham Avinu. They represented, they representing and being part in building a society, a modern Jewish, Jewish state in the land of Israel that will be a light to the nation, it will be a symbol of the way of life, the right way of life to the entire world. Not only technology, which is very important, the best technology we're going to uh, uh, spread to the entire world, not only biotech, not only knowledge, not only wealth. We're going to be the richest country in, in the world, I believe. Not in, not in very long time. But also values, also spiritual message will come out of Zion and more and more Israelis starting to understand that. This is, this is the dream. It is not a dream that you can uh, explain to the Israelis in one day. Slowly but surely, this uh, television guy that you saw, Avri Gilad, in the movie, he's a leftist. He's not religious. But he tells you, I started to think about the temple in a different way. It did not happen uh, in one day. But in the 
14, 15 months that I'm in the Knesset, I discovered that this message can go through without, of course, moving one inch from your beliefs and from your, and from your principle, principles. Tonight I want to represent to you the Jewish leadership, leadership solution to, the, to the, what they call the peace process. What is our alternative to the false Oslo process? We have an alternative, as I mentioned, in, in all of it, by, uh, uh, circles of life. We have, a, <coughs> we have <coughs> I believe we have an alternative <coughs> in the uh, economical, in the, in, to the economy uh, um, way Israel should function, the way Israel should, should function, function economically, the health system, of course the cultural system. We have our Jewish fingerprint, we have what to offer in all circles, but tonight I want to talk about our political solution. Because for 20 years, the left is giving us their solution, and when Benjamin Netanyahu, as the head of the opposition at that time, said that that's wrong, it's something wrong to do, Shimon Peres stood, up, stood on the, at the Knesset and told him, what is your alternative? What is your alternative? My, my alternative as, we, as I remember. And Netanyahu was, did not have an answer. And the right wing never had a real answer to that question. What is your alternative? What is our alternative? What is the Jewish alternative to bring peace to the Middle East? Well, tonight, we're going to bring this alternative and this alternative that, going to, that, that I'm going to represent shortly will be uh, uh, delivered to every Israel, Israeli in the coming few months. And we're expecting you, everybody, to help us do so. And once the Israelis will observe the fact that there is an alternative from a, from a Jewish point of view, from who they are, to the, this so-called peace process that brought us only bloodshed, that brought us only horrors in the last in the last 20 years, they'll pick it up and we'll continue with that. So what is our alternative? First we have to understand what, as, as they say, what was the problem with the Oslo process? You know, For many, many years, even before Oslo, we're hearing that the basic concept of the peace process should be land for peace. Land for peace. And that is true. Through all history, peace was always based on that concept. The side that won the war got the land. And those who lost the war got the peace, right? That's the way it works. If you win the war, you get the territory. If you lose the war, and you're lucky, you get peace, right? That's the way it works. I think the first time in the history of the world, those who won the war supposed to give land and those who lost the war, not only lost the war, but those who started the war and lost, supposed to get, supposed to get the peace. <coughs> it's the other way around. The one who, the one who wins the war gives the peace. The one who loses the war gives, gives the land. What's going on here? Did we lose the war in the Six Days War? Why should we, Israel, gives the land and not the peace. Did you ever ask yourself this question? <laughs> Many times. So I'll, I hope I'll be able to uh, solve that mysterical question. The answer is that yes, in the battlefields, the Israeli soldiers, mm. the heroical Israeli soldiers and commanders, won the battlefields. But we never real, really won the war. And you know why? 
Because the real war is not between the Jews and the Arabs. The real war is between the Jews and themselves. The real war is a war of identity, a war of, the, of, a war of dreams, as I named my second book, by the way. The war of dreams. It's between, the war between the Israeli dream and the Jewish dream. You see, Israel was based upon two contradiction, contradictional dreams. Two dreams that fight with each other. The Jewish dream that we always had was to fix the world and the kingdom of God in our own land, continue the, continue the march of Abraham, the message of one God, uh, to be a nation, not like all the nation, nation aside of the nations. This is one of the biggest blessings that we got from the mouth from Bilam Arasha at the time. A nation aside of the nations, a nation, a special nation that enriched the entire world in the message of Hashem. This is basically what Judaism is all about. But the Israeli dream is a different dream. The Israeli dream is Hen am kechol amim, am kechol amim, not am levadat ishkon, but am kechol amim, a nation like all the nation, a place among the nation, to be like 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 everybody else. That was the basic uh, Zionist dream. Let's be just like the rest of them. And these these two dreams are fighting inside the Israeli society all the time. Uh, and the state of Israel was based on the Israeli dream. We tried to create a new nation, an Israeli nation, not that grows up from the Jewish nation, but come instead of the Jewish nation. And the Israeli nation needs the Arabs. Because if only a Jew can be an Israeli, so you stay different. You need also the Arabic to be able to be Israeli. Arab Israeli, right? You need Ahmad Tibi to, to be Israeli. Then we are a nation like all the nations. We have a new nation based on civilian uh, nation, based on territory, not based on national, nationality. Uh, we always thought that the Oslo process, the Oslo concept, was about peace. The idea of the Oslo process was to bring peace. We will give them land and we'll get peace. But the truth is, it was not about peace. It was about, it was about getting rid of these territories in Judea and Samaria that carry on our Jewish identity. When you're walking in Shiloh, that we just saw in the movie, when we standing in Me'arat HaMachpela or in the Temple Mount, these territories are forcing our Jewish identity on us. These territories that carrying this uh, 3,000 years of message, these biblical territories forcing our Jewish identity on us. So we have to get rid of them. Now that sounds a little bit conspirative, right? Sounds like a conspiracy, as we say in Hebrew. But uh, I'm not the only one who's saying that. About two months ago, the major arch architect of Oslo, Dr. Ron Pundak, said the following. He said, I'll say it in Hebrew first, Hashalom eino hamatara. Israelization shel ha-medina b'mkom yehud shela. The peace is not the goal. The goal is Israel, Israelization of the, of, the, of the state instead of, of Judaism of the state. In other words, the whole Oslo process was not about peace. If it would have been about peace after the first bus blowing, it should be stopped, right? 
when it brings the when it brings only bloodshed, you immediately stop it. Hey, that's not we meant. But we see that we continue all the time. Why we continue all the time? Because peace was not the target. Peace was not the goal. The goal was a state of all its citizens, Israelizatia Shalavitina, instead of a Jewish state. The words from the mouth of the major architect of Oslo. A month later, he passed away, by the way. He said the truth and did his, did, his, did his share. So now that we understand what this peace process is all about, we understand what, what a Jewish leadership goal should be, exactly the opposite. We need a solution that gives us the opportunity to make Israel a real, a real Jewish state and not the state of all the citizens. That's the goal. If we fulfill, if that's the right goal, if that's what God expects us from, to have in our society, if that's the right goal, and we'll fulfill that goal, we'll have peace. Now, how are we going to do it? The plan, the Jewish uh, leadership peace plan has five stages. The first stage is Complete annex the land, full Israeli sovereignty. Full Israeli sovereignty, full Jewish sovereignty between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean in every part of Eretz Israel that, it's contr that, that controlled by the IDF, by Tzahal, that was given to us miraculously by God in all those wars with all the suffer and the uh, painful uh, price that we had to pay for it. Annex the whole land. And when I'm saying annex the whole land, I mean no other forces, not in Ramallah, not in Shechem, not in the Temple Mount, of course, any, only the IDF and the Israeli police. No other forces, no other sovereigns. Every, the last little Arab village, no matter what, in Judea and Samaria, in the Galilee, every Arab village will have a police Israeli station with an Israeli flag and only policemen with an Israeli uniform. No other forces, just as we had before the Oslo process. This is number one. And when I'm saying no other sovereignty, I mean not only no other national sovereignty or so-called national sovereignty, I mean also no other religion sovereignty, not Muslim sovereignty on the Temple Mount, not Christian sovereignty on Mount Zion, at the grave of our, of our King David, of David HaMelech, Chai Vekaya. And stage number two is, giving the position of permanent resident to those uh, uh, residents, to, to the Arabs, to the 1.7 Arab <coughs> Sudan and Samaria, giving those Arabs who accept the fact that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews and to the Jews only, and accept um, uh, the total Israeli sovereignty and don't declare any kind of uh, war, quiet war, of course, any other kind of war on the Israelis, giving them the ability to stay in their homes, getting all the human rights that we took away from our own brothers and sisters in Gush Katif, for example. All the human rights, but not a national political rights. And, the, and there's a tremendous difference between the two. And I'll take a minute to explain that. Human rights <coughs> is something that was given to us by God. So we cannot take it away from each other. We cannot take human rights, we cannot take the right to, to live, to work, honor each other, and so on. Political rights are being given by states that were made by people 
if it's the interest of the state to give political rights, it gives. If it's not, it doesn't have to. And to mix between the two, and to say that if you annex the land, you have to give the right to vote, and if you don't, you're an apartheid state, means that the United States of America is an apartheid state because of uh, Puerto Rico, for example. That uh, Hong Kong is an apartheid state. Czechia is an apartheid state. Latvia, 15% of the, of the uh, Latvian people cannot vote in the parliament. So Latvia, which is a, a part of the European Union, is an apartheid state. England is an apartheid state because England uh, took over parts of Cyprus and did, and did not let all, all those people in, that they took uh, uh, under its wing uh, to have the ability to vote in England and so on and so on. America is not an apartheid state because of, because of a, a citizen of Puerto Rico, if he goes on a bus, will never be taken off because of the color of his skin. So America is not an apartheid state. Saying that Israel, if it's taking over its own country and not giving immediately the right to vote to those that just yesterday declared war against it, uh, if it's not doing it, it's an apartheid state, it's the biggest, it is the biggest lie and we should not be uh, worried about it. Stage number three, we should encourage the Arabs and those who wish to leave, to leave, to leave the, uh, the land of Israel and find the future in a better place for them. And when I'm saying this, uh, uh, encourage, I mean giving them the ability to sell their homes where what they cannot do today. Today, 15,000 Arabs, and I'm not saying Palestinians because there is no Palestinian nation. But 15,000 already today, without having the ability, ability to sell their homes, because they'll get killed if they will. Yet, they live, leaving, uh, we should uh, encourage that process to continue. Uh, once there will be a full Israeli sovereignty, they'll be able to sell their homes. We're spending today enormous amount of money on the concept of Oslo. We spent trillion shekels until today on uh, barbed wires, on uh, missiles against missiles from Gaza, on uh, uh, guards in every coffee shop, on trucks of loads of, of cash that we send to Gaza every month, paying their electricity bill, the bills that they don't pay, and so on and so on. It's, it comes out to 11.4% of our income every year. It's crazy. We spend until today enough money to pay the average Arab salary in Judea and Samaria for the next 50 years. We should use part of that money to encourage them to leave and to minimize the amount uh, of Arabs that leave, it, leave, leave in uh, that stay in Judea and Samaria. Fourth, now stage number four is a wave, tremendous wave of building and flourishing the land in Judea and Samaria and the entire country. Stage number four, I mean, <clears throat> give the land to the Jews. Give it to you when you make Aliyah to Israel. I'm not talking about giving people money, buy and give give for free, but do exactly what they did here in America and Australia in every free state when they wanted to flourish the country. What did they do? They gave you the land, take the land, and build. As long as you build and flourish the state, the land is yours. And this is exactly what the Torah said. This is exactly the Jewish idea. Yeshua gives the land to, to the 12 tribes before they even take over the land. And we have to, each, each Jew has to have his own nachala in Eretz Israel. But in the state of Israel of today, it's exactly the opposite. Most of the, most of the land, over 90% of the land, belongs, belongs to, the, to, the, to the state. And that's why the prices of the house, house, housing are so, are so high in Israel. So change the whole system, flourish the land, lower the prices, make the Jews come. And that's the, sixth, that, that's the fifth stage. Encourage Aliyah, big Aliyah, to come from all over the world. <laughs> The first from there, of course, should be Jonathan Pollard.
comes to the other side, under that, under, under that kind of leadership, this is the alternative. What I just presented to you now is the real alternative to all this nonsense that's, that's, that's uh, going on for so many years, never did and never will bring, bring peace, but only bloodshed and more and more misery. So we have an alternative in all circles of life, alternative that comes from, right, from our identity, and we definitely have a political alternative to this peace process. This alternative in details, in uh, a whole campaign, should be brought to the Israelis to make sure that they'll pick it up together with the Jewish alternative, the Jewish uh, leadership that will implement it in, in the Israeli life. This is the future. The future is it's in our hands. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Now, take questions. If you have, just raise your hand. I just asked uh, my a request that it be a question and not a speech. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you had mentioned. Um, Granting permanency status, resident, uh, resident status to the uh, Arabs in the Sharia. What about Israeli Arabs? And also, the second question I want to ask you is about Israel's uh, plan. How would it affect the uh, the fact that Israel is becoming increasingly isolated? So, what would you do to address that? We didn't hear the question. The first question was, you want to you say it again? No. <laughs> No, you can say it. If we did my permanent residence status that you would give to the Arabs of Judea and Samaria, what would happen to Israeli Arabs? Okay. What will happen to the Israeli Arabs while we're giving permanent residence uh, to the Arabs in Judea and Samaria? The Israeli Arabs already have an Israeli, uh, full Israeli citizenship. If I like it or not, uh, it's, a, it's a different question. I can tell you that uh, I think Israel should change later on, after, we, uh, after that peace process will, uh, uh, will be implemented. Uh, we should look to change the Israeli system. Um, then that will solve the problem also with the, with the Israeli Arabs, but I don't want to get into it uh, right now. Uh, the second question was, what will be, uh, what will be the international uh, reaction to this uh, peace process? My belief is that the way the world treats us is the, uh, basically uh, the way we treat ourselves. If they see that uh, we believe in ourselves, uh, we, we truly believe that we represent justice, uh, the world accept that. Today, the Israeli youngsters, the, is the young generation in Israel, and I'm talking about people uh, up to the age of 35, feel or live under the impression that they are just visitors in their own country. The country really, believe, really belongs to the Arabs. Why? Because when Yitzhak Rabin shook the hand of Arafat 20 years ago, uh, basically declared that there is a Palestinian nation and they do deserve and, and, the, and the heart of the land belongs to them. Uh, um, Israelis that let's say were 15 years old and today are 35 started to have, have their own idea, their own, their own political ideas then at the age of 15, 14 when a person starting to have his you know way of mind as they say in Hebrew um, um, so a whole generation grew up in the last 20 years under the impression that the land do not belongs to us because if Judea and Samaria don't belong to us, nothing belongs to us. If the Temple Mount don't belong belongs to us, but definitely Tel Aviv does not belong to us. So we sh there's a lot of fixing over here that needs to be done. A lot of uh, uh, 
changing that needs to be done, a very clear message that comes from the Israeli leadership that will have the Rav Hashem soon, and it says, this is our land, will change the way we see the, the, the connection between us and the land of Israel, and when, we'll, when we will see it the right way, also the world will see it the right way. The world is just, the world is just a mirror to what's going on between us and ourselves. Yes, please. In the 1920s, uh, the San Remo Conference uh, established that the uh, Jews had a position of the Indian Samaritans. Why has at that point the argued more Well, you're absolutely right. Some of the more uh, some more decision. Those who say, of course, our right to the land comes from the Torah. Not, right. not from some of the more, not from the Lord Balfour and so on. However, this is the, these decisions of Lord Balfour in England at the beginning of 1917, and then in some of the more in 1920, and also in, in a few other decisions, put a, a foundation to what they call today the international law. So it's not only the Jewish law, it's also the international law that, that is in our side. But all that does not gonna, doesn't gonna help you if you yourself saying it's not mine. Right. Which goes back to what I just said before. <laughs> Think for it. You know, they say Israel do not know how to explain itself. We have a terrible Hasbara. You know what Hasbara means? Propaganda, I don't know. Uh, how about PR? Israel is a terrible, terrible PR. We don't know how to explain ourselves. Um, it's not true. It's not that we don't invest enough money in PR. It's, it is different. It's worse, much worse than that. We explain our enemies. You know what the basic has Israeli Hasbara is for the last 40 years? Basically, we say the follow. Definitely the last 20 years since the Oslo process started. Uh, basically what we say is the follow. Yes, we came from Europe, we are the last colonialists that came from Europe and took over the land of the poor Palestinian natives. We came in 48 and we took over the, their land until the Green Line. Then we came again in 67 and we took over the rest of the land until the Jordan River. Well now, being that we have nowhere else to go, and look what happened to us when we were in Europe, so Definitely know have nowhere to go. That's why we have Yad Vashem. So, so, uh, so everybody will understand. It. We have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. We're stuck here. We cannot leave. Um, uh, so we're gonna do the follow. We're gonna give those the real owners of the land, the you know, native Palestinians. We're gonna give them what we took away from them in '67, and they will give will will, will give up on what we took from them. Uh, in 48. Sounds, sounds like a great Hasbara. No? <laughs> and all the more and all the decisions and all the nice words are going to help you, but this is what you're basically saying. Okay? Any of the Jewish leadership that says something totally different, this is our land, this is the land that God gave us. We have, we have, and, and our right to the land, you'll be surprised, is not because of the past. Our real right to the land is because of the future. Because of what we're going to grow on that land. The message is going to come out from, from Zion, from to the entire world. This is the real right that we have to that land. Yes, please. You spoke about encouraging the Arabs to emigrate. How exactly did you do that? Oh, oh boy. There are two, first of all, as I, as I explained, they looking to leave anyhow. Mm -hmm. According to their own surveys, I'm talking about their universities in, in Anajach, in Shechem, and Birzeit, in Ramallah, according to their own surveys, about 60% of them uh, wish to leave anyhow. You're talking about 1.7 million Arabs in Judea and Samaria, which is about between 250 and, and 300,000 families. That's it. That's what you're talking about. Demographically, by the way, the numbers of Arabs going down, numbers of Jews going up all the time. Demographically, we're winning. Demographically, in 15 years from now, there's going to be 
majority of Jews between Judea, between the Jordan, between, between the, the, the Jordan River and the Mediterranean without changing anything. So it's the, I'm not talking about demographic problem, I'm talking about justice. This is not their land, it's ours. So we should help them uh, continue that process. And I explained that the way we should do it is A, those who wishes to leave, let them go without being killed by their own brothers. Those who wishes to uh, sell their homes should be able to do so, not being slaughtered by their own people, as it is today. In Jordan, by the way, today, in, in, in the Jordanian state, there's a life, there's a death penalty to a citizen to sell his home to a Jew today. The Jordan, which we have peace with. Okay? Uh, so this is a once will take over and will be full sovereignty, Israeli police everywhere, there won't be any fear over there because uh, Israel will protect them. They'll be able to do so. And those who do so also get what I call in Hebrew Sal Hagira. You know there is Sal Klita in Israel, a basket of um, all, all kind of good terms to those of the Jews that are coming should be the same thing to the Arabs who wishes to leave, helping them find uh, work, helping them find uh, places to go, and buying their homes, giving money where you need to. And we have that money, but today we invest as, as invested as I, as, as I explained in uh, continuing the Oslo process, the Oslo bloodshed process in many, many ways. Uh, yes. I like to answer that question. We're going to start in Nefesh Benefesh for leaving Israel. <laughs> we can just switch homes between Montreal and Ramallah. <laughs> yes, please. Rightfully, Hasbara and the lack of the proper diplomacy and PR is wonderful. But what can be done about improving the Israeli education system to prepare the youth before they enter universities and meet the assault of the well-educated Palestinian students who have their rhetoric and there is no, the Israeli students have no defenses, they have no, they're not armed to defend themselves ever against the life and the death. Well, you're touching a very sore point. You're like talking about the educational system. I can give you now a lecture for the whole evening only about that subject. Look. Uh, I believe that the basic idea of the state, any, any state, actually it's not me, it's the Rambam that says so. What is the goal of the state? What is the reason to have a state? The Rambam says, Melech Oseh Milchamot O Mishpat. What should a, should a king, what should a kingdom, a Medina should, what, what is responsibility? Security. Outside security, Milchamot, and inside security, Mishpat, police, an army, justice system, and protection against your enemies. That's it. The state should not deal with almost anything else. You know how much money the state of Israel invests in education? More than security. The real number are bigger than the uh, defense, man, defense man, uh, uh, office. And what do we get in return? Israel, young, youngster, young Israelis at the age of 18 know nothing about their heritage, know nothing about, know nothing, booing <laughs> them, know nothing. The whole educational system should be totally different, should be the voucher system that gives the parents the ability to educate their kids, give them back the responsibility on their kids, and the ability to educate the kids the way they want. Most of the Israelis want, it, want a, a, a Jewish education, and it should be uh, easily 
giving giving to the to the to the kids when so much money will be invested instead of in those systems that hide Judaism from the kids, give and offer offer that to them. But that's a a whole different lecture. Tonight I wanted to, to talk about the peace plan, not the, about the educational plan. Yes, please. Um, quick question. If you're going to make uh, the Israeli army voluntary and paid for, um, who do you think is going to join? Everybody. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'll explain the question. Uh, I'm in favor of making the Israeli army a professional army, uh, or army of volunteers. Uh, the truth is that the army already today is that kind of is based on, on, on volunteers. Um, uh, we can have a much more professional army, uh, army that's based on people that uh, will know what they do, uh, army that don't carry on its back thousands and thousands of soldiers that simply do nothing. Yes, more questions, please. In practical terms, what do you propose doing about the Dome of the Rock, which is on the Temple Mount, and how do you propose doing it without unleashing bloodshed on an epic scale? The, uh, I'll start from the end. Uh, unleashing bloodshed happens when they feel that we don't uh, see ourselves uh, as the owners of the place. It should be only Israeli police on the mountain, not the Muslim Waqf, not any other kind of sovereignty. You should have the right to <coughs> pray. And, uh, and just a separate to bring Korban Pesach, for example, which you don't need to start even building Beit HaMikdash for that. You can start do some of the work uh, on, on the Temple Mount already, already today, even before. But let me tell you, you know what? Uh, I'll, uh, I want to tell you something about Beit HaMikdash. Maybe with that we'll finish tonight. You know that uh, lately our Prime Minister trying to fight against Abu Mazen and all the forces uh, in the Arab world who do not, will not accept uh, Israel as a Jewish state. Right? Netanyahu says you must agree that Israel is a Jewish state before we continue the negotiation. Why? Because they, and what do they say? What do the Arabs say? We uh, accept the Israeli state. Period. Why do they say they accept? And by the way, it connects to what, I, to what I explained before. They do accept the Israeli state. They do not accept the Jewish state. Why? Because if they accept the Israeli state, then they can say now all the, the, the diaspora of the Palestinians, so-called Palestinians, can come into Israel, be Israelis, and that's it. They're going to be very quickly the majority in the state, and so on. They understand that the Israeli state without the Jewish connection is going to be uh, uh, the immediate destruction of the, of, the, of the Jewish state and the dream that we all dream. So they're not willing to accept the concept of a Jewish state. And Netanyahu is trying to force on them to accept us as a Jewish state. Now I'm sitting in the Knesset and I hear Zehava Galon, which is Chavak member Knesset, Zehava Galon was the, was the head of the Meretz, telling Netanyahu, Netanyahu is sitting right there and saying to him, what are you asking them to, to accept the Jewish state? It's, well, do we need them to decide what is the Jewish state? And Netanyahu answered her, which is not so common that the Prime Minister sitting in the parliament and start arguing from his seat. And I'm listening, what is he saying there? And Netanyahu tells Zehava Gadon, Yes, of course, we want peace. But they say there was never Beit Mikdash on the Temple Mount. I don't used to hear those words from the Prime Minister. That sounds very interesting. Netanyahu is talking about Beit Mikdash. 
<laughs> not such a religious guy, you know. Interesting. Religious What's going on? A few days later, on Friday night, I didn't see it because because I keep Shabbat, you know. But the biggest, you know, the, the, the most important news program is on Friday night in Israel, on Channel 2, which is the biggest channel in Israel. They, all the reporters gather together Friday night, and they're interviewing one of these terrorists in Gaza. I think the Oslo process becomes a diplomat. Muhammad Dakhlan, his name. Uh, and they're asking him all kinds of questions, and who, who does he blame you know, to, to the stop of the peace talks and so on. Suddenly, the most important reporter over there, Ehudi Ali, very well-known reporter in Israel, asks Muhammad Dakhlan, and, 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 and very surprising question. He says, Yasser Arafat said that there was no Ben Mikdash on the Temple Mount. What do you think? Did the Jews have a Temple Mount on Bet on, 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 uh, ben Mikdash on, on the Temple Mount or not? A Temple on the Temple Mount or not? I saw you can see it on YouTube. Hey, this is the news, the broadcast on Shabbat, it's not even to religious Jews. What do you care if Muhammad Dakhlan thinks it was a Ben Mikdash or wasn't Ben Mikdash? What does the Prime Minister care if there was a, if they say, say there was a Ben Mikdash or not? What's about this Ben Mikdash thing that makes everybody crazy in Israel? You think about failing? Okay, he's crazy, fanatic, uh, religious. Netanyahu, El Ali, Channel 2, Muhammad Dakhlan, yes, Ben Mikdash, no Ben Mikdash. What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. They started to understand, not talking about the right-wingers or the religious people, the entire Israeli society starting to understand that if, you, if you're not longing to the third temple by foot, by going up there to the Temple Mount as you saw in the movie, if you're not longing and praying for the third temple, you're losing the first and the second. True. Yes, but we know they built the mosque there, so there are. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying. What, what do I mean that you're losing the first and the second? You see, the Arabs destroying every sign of the temple, and there's a lot of signs of the temple, first and second over there, let me tell you. So come with me one day, I'll show you. I was just there. Okay, a lot of signs. And they're destroying the archaeology, but worse than that. Because we are not there, and because we show that we lost connection, and because we agree not to pray there, and to going there as tourists, not as, not as proud Jews that have any kind of connection over there, they can say there was never Beit Mikdash. And when they say there was no Beit Mikdash and there is no reaction from Israel, it means Israelis has no history because our history starts and ends with the temple. Our whole history is around that point, the temple, Beit Hamikdash Yerushalayim. And when you have no history, you are not really a nation. You are just a religion. And when you are not really a nation, you don't deserve a country. True. So without this temple, Temple Mount. And going back to the Temple Mount, without that point that we used to be so much afraid of, because it will be bloodshed and will be uh, and will start fire and all that, so we were so much afraid of it. But when we ran away from it, we lost the foundation to justify the existence of our state. It's amazing what's going on. So don't be afraid of coming back to the Temple Mount, because this is the only way we can establish a real Jewish state.
Occasional, you finished selling the raffle tickets, I'll take more questions. Two more questions. Two more questions. And someone's going and to you decide which ones, because uh, I'm not going to fight you. Okay. This fellow over there and this young woman over there. Okay, this fellow over there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Can I the back? You offered a very clear axiomatic distinction between God-given natural rights and state-given political rights, and you very clearly stated that both political and religious sovereignty belong to the state. So I'm wondering if you can unpack what religious rights uh, if you can uh, attribute to uh, the, the category of natural God-given rights for all people. What religious right? What? What religious rights are included in natural rights, God-given rights that? As oh, that's a that's a huge basket of rights. The right to work, the right to live, the right not to be humiliated. Of course, the right to not, no, no one can touch your life, no, can, no one can take away your property. Basically, everything we did to our fellow brothers and sisters in Gush Katif, we're not allowed to do, not to Jews, not to, not to Arabs. This, this is human rights. And by the way, I did not even get into it. The last thing they're looking for is to vote. It was never part of their culture. There's no Arab country that they really that have real so-called democracy. I don't think that is. There, we should once and for all understand that their uh, initiative, okay, is not to uh, to have a state. Is that the Jews will not have one? Okay. So, you know when when. Uh, Ernst, Be Ernst Bevin, you heard the name? Ernst Bevin? Ernst Bevin was the, for was the foreign minister of the British Men during the British Mandate time. He came up with a white paper that uh, not allowed the Jews to make Aliyah, Exodus, uh, and so on, all that. And he was not a big Jew lover, okay? But in 1947, when the UN, the question of, this, of Palestine, came back to the UN, he, as a representative of the ruler of the place, the British Mandate, came to the UN to explain what the problem in the Middle East. And he said the following. He said, the Jewish goal in Palestine, as he called it, uh, is uh, uh, to have a Jewish state in the land of Israel. The Arab goal in Palestine is What? That the Jews will not have a state in the land of Israel. And nothing's changed, changed since then. So let's not fool ourselves. And you were the best guess. So I want to know with the journalist how he answered that question. Did he say that there was a... Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I also very much wanted to know how he answered. So Muhammad Dakhlan uh, told uh, uh, Ehudi Ali, uh, look, it's holy to both uh, people. No, he didn't out from the question. Instead of answering, was there a big dash or not, he said, it's holy to both of us. So Eudiali said, I know it's holy to both of us, but I asked you a different question. Do you say, do you believe that there was a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount 2,000 years ago, yes or no? And Muhammad Dachman did not answer, and the young uh, journalists felt uh, very uncomfortable where the discussion is going to an end and saved Muhammad Akhlan with a new question and that was the end of it. But that meant that he really meant yes, if he didn't say no, then he, he, yeah, he was he, afraid to he say did not, He would not be able to say yes because saying yes means that there is Jewish people. Saying yes means that the Jews do have history in the Temple Mount and the Arabs not. You see, it is either us or theirs. It cannot be both belongs to both of, all of us. When you say that the Temple Mount belongs to the Arabs, you say there's no place for the Jews anywhere in the land of Israel, and verse 5, the other way around. Thank you.